Hi everyone. Um, so what I plan to do is to use the extended handout uh, as a basis uh, for my discussion. Um, the extended handout uh, can be found on Moodle um, and I'll uh, have this up on the screen. I'll talk through it and elaborate um, and hopefully uh, this will sort of help you understand, especially some of the more difficult points on the handout. Um, and the handout as a whole really captures uh, the essence of this topic. So together with the readings uh, and any questions you might want to send my way, uh, this will provide you with a good grounding in the topic. So the topic, as I said, uh, for this week will be decision theory. Um, and I'll send an email out shortly uh, concerning next week's topic, um, and I'll do a similar recording uh, regarding that topic. So, uh, decision theory, I think, um, probably a good choice on, on your part uh, to cover this topic, in that it's um, uh, really an interesting one. And it's one that really shows the kind of one of the virtues of formal epistemology. So in particular, in formal epistemology, especially on the orthodox Bayesian model, uh, we are trying to represent people's degrees of belief in terms of probabilities. Um, and one virtue of this is that it allows us to think a bit more precisely uh, not only about what beliefs are rational, what degrees of belief are rational, but also about what decisions are rational. So, uh, as one might expect, one's state of belief, um, one's degrees of belief, uh, might make a difference uh, to uh, what it's rational for one to do. So, um, a simple example might be that uh, if you think it's very likely to rain, uh, it would seem to make rational sense to take an umbrella with you uh, when you go out, even though um, it might be mildly inconvenient to uh, to do this. Um, if you think it's very unlikely to rain, then it might not be rational uh, to take an umbrella with you. So that's the with this week. How do these rational degrees of belief... Um, or, uh, um, uh, degrees of belief that might be justified, uh, more or less, uh, feed through into, into decision-making. And essentially, there are two rival ways of thinking about this connection. Um, so two rival decision theories. Um, the sort of classic and orthodox one is known as expected utility theory. And this is quite widely used or uh, discussed in, in economics. Some of you might be familiar with it already. Um, there's a sort of heterodox model of decision theory that has gained quite a lot of popularity among philosophers. Um, and in some of the disciplines like uh, computer science, um, but isn't quite yet at least as mainstream as uh, expected utility theory. And this rival approach is known as causal decision theory, or sometimes causally expected utility theory. And so what we're going to do is introduce both of these approaches and uh, examine basically their advantages and disadvantages, um, wh wh which we reckon to be the best. So we'll start with the orthodox decision theory, the evidential decision theory. Now, in order to really get to grips with it, we need to introduce some some formalism. Um, so what, what we want to do is we want to think about the sort of actions available to an agent. So an agent's trying to decide how to act. Uh, that's why it's a decision theory. Um, and we might suppose that the outcomes of the action, and I guess this is what makes decision theory interesting, the outcomes of an action might not be perfectly certain, right? So imagine, for instance, the government trying to decide how to act in the face of the coronavirus epidemic. Um, the range of actions they have available to them have 
uncertain outcomes. Uh, they might be able to assign probabilities to those outcomes, um, but uh, they've got to make a decision on the basis of those uh, those probabilities rather than perfect certainty. So we might suppose that um, uh, an action that an agent has available to them, we'll call this action A, has a number of possible outcomes. Um, we'll denote these O1 through ON, as, as on the handout here. Um, now, the outcomes are things that the agent assigns values or utilities to. Um, so, um, obviously, well, hopefully, the government, uh, uh, if we consider the government to be the agent, um, then hopefully, uh, for instance, their, their utility for an outcome involving a low death rate from the virus and um, maybe limited damage to the economy, hopefully their utility for that would be high. In the case of the individual agents, uh, in the simpler uh, umbrella scenario, uh, presumably their uh, utility for not getting wet is high. Um so anyway, the utilities are attached to these various outcomes um, can be denoted uh, with this sort of uh, function, this utility function uh, that I'm denoting with the U. So U of O1 is the utility or the value that the agent assigns to outcome 1. Uh, U of ON in general is uh, the utility that the agent assigns to uh, or derives from outcome ON. Now, the next point is that uh, the agent has these probabilities, right? So they don't have certainty about the outcomes, but probabilities of the action will lead to these outcomes. And we think about those in terms of their conditional credences or conditional subjective probabilities that the various outcomes will occur given that the agent performs action A. So these are denoted just using a, a credence function, which we'll, we're supposing is a probability function. Um, so uh, the probability of outcome one conditional upon A um, uh, is something she's interested in. So the probability that uh, she'll get wet or stay dry rather if she uh, doesn't uh, take her umbrella um, is, is a, the sort of thing she might be interested in. Now, um, okay, so we've got the outcomes, the possible outcomes of the action A. We've got the utilities associated with the those outcomes and the probabilities that the agent assigns uh, to those outcomes conditional upon her performing action A. So now we can calculate uh, the expected utility uh, that the agent associates uh, with the action A. And what this involves is simply uh, taking the utility of each possible outcome um, and multiplying it by the probability that out that outcome occurs uh, conditional upon her performing that action A. Um, so we multiply the utility of the outcome by the probability or her credence that the outcome will occur given that she performs action A. And we do this for each outcome and then we sum the results. And uh, the sum um, furnishes the expected utility that the agent assigns to A. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the utility of the various outcomes, uh, we're weighting them by their probabilities and the result is the expected utility of the action. So we'll give a couple of illustrations of this calculation um, later on, and hopefully this will make it a bit more concrete um, and maybe a bit more intuitive. So first, that the sort of general abstract statement of what expected utility theory says is that when an agent is forced to choose between a set of mutually exclusive actions, like taking her umbrella or not taking her umbrella, then she ought to form that one 
which has the highest expected utility. And just to be clear, um, expected utility theory on the orthodox version understands expected utility in terms of the formula given here on the handout. Um, uh, whereas cause, causal decision theory is going to, under, going to use a slightly different formula. Okay, so let's illustrate this. Um, and our first illustration is this example, which I'm calling medication. So the example is as follows. Uh, suppose that Alice, our agent, uh, has an illness, which isn't serious, but it's unpleasant. Um, now, there's one known medication uh, that can be used to treat this illness. And Alice is deciding between two mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive actions, so there are no other actions available to her besides these two, and she can't perform both of the actions. So uh, option A, action A, is to take the medication. Action B is to not take the medication. Now, we'll suppose that some people who take this medication uh, suffer a fairly serious side effect. Um, and so this can give us a, a sort of rich way of thinking about the outcome. So uh, there are sort of four possibilities um, when it comes to the outcomes that Alice is interested in. So outcome one is uh, her continuing to suffer the illness and also suffering the side effect. Uh, the second one is her continuing to suffer the illness, but having no side effect. The third one is her um, being cured of the illness, um, but suffering the side effect. Um, and the fourth one is uh, her being cured of the illness and not suffering the side effect. So presumably the best, that's the best option. Now, we'll just sort of stipulate some utilities that we'll suppose that Alice associates with these four possible outcomes. So we'll suppose that the utility that she associates with continued illness and side effect, which is presumably the worst, is a utility of minus 10. Uh, the second one was uh, continued illness, but no side effect. Uh, we'll suppose that um, has a utility of minus four. The third one was being cured of illness, but suffering the side effect. And remember the side effect serious, so uh, maybe this is worse than having uh, the illness, but not suffering the side effect. So her utility of being cured, but having the side effect, we'll suppose is minus six. Um, and we'll stipulate that um, her utility for being cured of the illness and suffering no side effect is plus, in other words, positive five. Um, these are more or less just sort of arbitrary stipulations. We could have stipulated it another way, but this just gives a, uh, a bit more concreteness. I mean, of course, there's a sort of um, question about exactly how we measure utilities um, and whether we can measure utilities, which is a, um, a sort of difficulty or a challenge, at least for all forms of, of decision theory. Um, w one approach is um, to try to get a handle on this in terms of agents' preferences. Um, so, for instance, if... Uh, someone prefers um, uh, ice cream to peas, uh, <coughs> then one can suppose that uh, the utility that they associate with eating ice cream is greater than the utility that they associate with eating peas. Um, and if uh, someone's indifferent between ice cream and trifle, uh, one can suppose that those utilities are the same. Now, this sort of gives you a, a ranking, uh, sort of pre a preference ranking or a utility, uh, utility ranking. <coughs> and then the big challenge is to um, try to see whether we can assign uh, 
cardinal values, uh, that is numerical values to these those utilities, and not merely a ranking. So there are so, some sort of clever attempts to do this that we won't go into uh, for, for the purposes of this this topic. Um, it takes us a bit too far afield. Um, and we'll just suppose that, that, that this is in fact possible. Right, so the final part of our example is to uh, to stipulate or specify the conditional probabilities that Alice assigns. In other words, her conditional subjective probabilities or conditional credences. So let's suppose that, uh, remember, A is the action of taking the medication, B is the action of not taking the medication, um, suppose that the probability of the unfortunate case in which she continues to be ill um, and suffers a side effect as well, so the medication can produce a side effect, and we're also supposing that it's not completely reliable in preventing the disease or curing the disease. Uh, so the probability that she'll continue to have the disease and uh, unfortunately suffer the side effect will suppose is point uh, zero five. Um, the probability that she will continue to have the disease uh, but not have the side effect will suppose is uh, that is given that she takes the medication uh, is point two. The probability uh, that she will be cured of the disease and suffer the side effect if she takes the medication is point one and the probability that she'll both be cured and not suffer the side effects of the best outcome, uh, we'll suppose is 0.65. Now, um, uh, when it comes to action B, the action, the possible action of not taking the medication, uh, we can suppose that, well, the, we'll just for simplicity suppose that the probability of her uh, being cured is, is zero if she doesn't take the medication. So that means uh, the probability of O1, the outcome in which she's cured and suffers a side effect, and the probability of O3, outcome O3, in which she's cured um, uh, but doesn't suffer the side effect, uh, they're both zero conditional upon her not taking the medication. Um, now, we can suppose that uh, the uh, probability that uh, she... Uh, isn't cured, um, but suffers a... St oh, sorry, I've got this the wrong way around. So, uh, the prob what I should have said is we should suppose that if she doesn't take the medication, the probability of her suffering the side effect is zero, right? So, uh, actually, I, in, in these probabilities, I've assumed there's some probability of her getting better all by herself without taking the medication. So, so actually what the first probability says is that the probability of her, um, uh, her not being cured and suffering the side effect is zero. And the third one says that the probability of her being cured and suffering the side effect is zero. And that's just because the probability of her suffering the side effect is zero, uh, given that she doesn't take the medication. So the second one says that the probability of uh, her um, not suffering the side effect and not being cured um, is... Uh, uh, point 0.9, uh, given that she takes the medication. Sorry, I'm just, uh, I've kind of confused myself with this. I'm not sure I've got the probabilities the right way around. Uh, let me just... Um, okay, so... Illness and side effects should be zero. That's right. So the first one's right. Um, yeah, I've got these the wrong way around on here, uh, which is what was confusing me. There's a typo. 
Um, so O1 is illness and side effect. Uh, so that should be zero because of zero probability she gets a side effect if she doesn't take the medication. Um, o4 is no illness and no side effect. Um, yeah, so that's okay. Um, as point as being positive. Um, O3 is no illness and side effects, so yeah, that, that should also be zero um, because she doesn't take the, the medication in scenario B. Um, right, yeah, so I haven't got this wrong way around at all. I'm just getting myself confused uh, for no, no good reason. O2 was a scenario in which uh, she continues to have the illness um, but doesn't have the side effect, right? So, of course, we should suppose that to be quite high um, given that she doesn't take the medication. So, the probability that she'll continue to have the illness and um, not suffer the side effect is quite high uh, given option B that she doesn't take the medication. So, 0.9, whereas the probability that she spontaneously recovers um, but doesn't have a side effect is comparatively low um, given that she doesn't take the medication at point one. So sorry about the confusion there. I just confused myself. What stated on the handout is, is exactly right. Um, okay, so we've gone through all of these numbers. Um, and finally, we can calculate the expected utilities associated with option A, taking the medication, and option B, not taking the medication. And recall that what we do is, for instance, in calculating the expected utility of option A, is take the utilities of each of the possible outcomes associated with A and uh, multiply these uh, by the probability that the agent assigns um, to that outcome being the one that materialises conditional upon A, and then sum up the results. <coughs> so in the example in hand, um, we uh, have four possible outcomes, O1 through O4. Um, what the agent wants to do, for instance, is take the utility that she associates with O1, multiply it by the probability that O1 comes to pass, conditional upon A, uh, take the utility associated with O2, multiply it by the probability um, that uh, she gives for O2, conditional upon her performing action A, and so on for 3 and 4, and then add up the results, and that gives the, the expected utility associated with the yeah, action A. So, <coughs> this is uh, the, the rest of the calculation is just simply a matter of uh, calculating from the numbers that we've given above. Uh, so we just plug in the numbers that we've given above for each of these terms, uh, and then we just perform some basic maths, and we get the result that the, the agent's expected utility associated with taking the medication is 1.89. Um, like very exactly analogously for option B, not taking the medication. Obviously, there we're interested in the probability of the outcomes conditional upon not taking the medication, conditional action B rather than A. Um, so we just perform the calculation given the numbers that we've give, been given above, and we arrive at an expected utility associated with B, not taking the medication, of negative 3.55. So obviously... Um, positive 1.89 is greater than negative uh, 3.55. So, at least on the assumption that the agent's probabilities and utilities are as we described, um, expected utility in its orthodox form uh, tells us that Alice shouldn't take the medication. Okay, so... That just provides an illustration of the standard workings of the theory. Um, hopefully, 
it seems reasonably intuitive. It's it's most people at least initially find it reasonably attractive. As I say, it's it's kind of the orthodox theory. Um, so it's the orthodox theory in economics, and uh, it's certainly very popular in philosophy. Now, what we want to do now is to introduce the rival theory of causally expected utility theory, or sometimes called causal decision theory, um, and compare and contrast the two theories. Um, but in order to do so, it's actually going to be helpful to take a little bit of a, a detour to, to help us understand um, causal decision theory more when we come to, to set it out formally. Um, and the, the, the detour firstly involves thinking about this notion of states of the world. So often when we're doing uh, decision theory, um, it's helpful to think kind of quasi-deterministically. Um, so the idea is that we suppose that uh, which outcome occurs uh, in a decision scenario depends upon, firstly, uh, what action the agent performs, but also the state of the world, right? So the agent isn't perfectly knowledgeable about um, the state of the world, um, hence she's uncertain about what consequences her action will produce. Um so, for instance, um, the government, think about the government making the decision about how to respond to COVID-19. Um, well, the government faces a lot of uncertainty about the state of the world. They uh, face uncertainty about how many people actually have the virus at the moment. Uh, they have uncertainty about um, uh, exactly... Uh, who is uh, tends to be infected by the virus. Uh, they have uncertainty about um, whether there'll be a, a vaccine developed or when it will be developed. Uh, they have uncertainty um, about um, these sorts of, you know, how people respond to the virus, what, what uh, sociologically, whether people will actually self-isolate uh, as they're advised to and so on. So there's a lot of uncertainty that the government faces about, about the state of the world, about people's intentions, about um, uh, the the prospects for, for um, treatment and cures so, uh, of vaccines. Um, and this is uh, what makes, or at least part of what makes them uncertain, what outcomes in terms of things like death rates and infection rates and economic damage uh, will be uh, will result from the various actions they can take in response to the virus. Um, so sort of one way of thinking and, and uh, it's just simp simple to sort of think about the world as kind of being underlying de deterministic. We don't actually really need this, but uh, it's a sort of useful heuristic. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I've applied it to, uh, Alice's case in making her decision about, uh, whether to take the medication on the handout. Um, so for instance, we might suppose that, uh, whether or not Alice is cured and whether or not she suffers a side effect depend <coughs> not only on her action, but also facts about, uh, her genetics and uh, other aspects of a physiology. Um, now, these are the facts that are part of the, what, what we're calling the state of the world. Um, and we might suppose there's, there's kind of a, a partition of states of the world or types of state of the world, um, W1 through W4. Um, and these are the ones that are going to make the relevant difference to what results from Alice's action. Um, so, for instance, we might suppose that her taking the medication deterministically produces outcome O1, that is her being uh, uh, 
uh, not being cured and uh, uh, her suffering the side effect if the state of the world is W1, uh, whereas her action produces outcome O2 if the state of the world is W2, it produces O3 if the state of the world is W3 and O4 if the state of the world is W4. Um, so we're thinking quasi-deterministically, so in other words, for each uh, outcome and corresponding state of the world, uh, WI, the, the corresponding outcome is OI, uh, the probability of, and this I guess should be thought of in terms of an objective probability or chance, uh, the chance uh, of outcome OI uh, conditional upon her performing action A and the state of the world being WI is 1. So that's just to say that uh, actions uh, combine uh, with states of the world to bring about outcomes with certainty. And so the agent's uncertainty is just to be thought of in terms of her uncertainty about the state of the world. Now... Um, the, the flip side of that is that um, uh, given that the outcomes are mutually exclusive and the states of the world are mutually exclusive, um, if the uh, state of the world is not WI, then the agent's action is going to combine with it in such a way as to deterministically not produce the corresponding outcome OI, so the probability of OI conditional upon, and this is an objective probability again, the probability of OI uh, conditional upon uh, A and uh, not WI is zero. So the upshot is... This is a, a little bit complex. Um, well, it's not that complex, but it's it's sort of feels a little bit tangential at this stage. But hopefully, the relevance will be seen later on. Um, is that basically it can pro be proven relatively simply? And I've done this in the appendix, which I won't go through. You can read it through yourself. It's straightforward. Um, that from what we've said, it follows that basically the agent's uncertainty about what outcome will happen conditional upon her action can be reduced to her or is the same as her uncertainty about what the state of the world is. So hopefully that's fairly intuitive in, in light of what's gone previously. Now, if we assume that the state of the world is independent of the agent's action, um, then the probability that she assigns uh, to the state of the world being WI, um, conditional upon her action, um, should be the same as, or is the same as, the probability uh, of WI. Um, that's just what it means uh, to be probabilistically independent. So uh, the agent's action is independent in the sense that her performing the action neither raises nor lowers the probability of the state of the world being WI. Um, so, for instance, in the uh, Alice case, um, her taking the medication, we're supposing doesn't influence her genetics and her pre-existing physiology. All right, so the next step is that it follows uh, from uh, uh, equalities three and four um, that the agent's uh, conditional probability um, for the outcome OI, conditional upon her action A, is just her probability uh, that the state of the world is of the corresponding one WI, namely the one that combines with A to produce outcome OI. No, okay, so so the upshot of all this is that uh, where this is true, where the, the uh, states of the world bring about the outcomes in combination with actions, 
uh, where the state of the world is independent um, of uh, the agent's actions, um, we can reduce our, or I suppose simplify somewhat, our expected utility formula um, so that it just says that the probability or the expected utility uh, the agent associates with, out, with action A is uh, the weighted sum of the utilities of the various possible outcomes of action A uh, where they're weighted by uh, the probability that the agent assigns to the corresponding state of the world obtaining. All right, so um, that's all fairly abstract, but some of this will become... Um, uh, hopefully become a bit more intuitive and a bit more applied later on. Okay, right. Now, um, let's next shift topics slightly, but we'll see how these topics interact, um, and consider what's known as the dominance principle, which seems like a uh, condition... Uh, on rational decision. Um, now, the, the obvious question is, how does the dominance principle relate to uh, the uh, principle that uh, maximizing expected utility, which is what expected utility theory says? And we'll, we'll see exactly how they relate as we go on. But the dominance principle on its own seems rather plausible. So, Suppose, to see the, see what the dominance principle says, um, let's suppose uh, that the states of the world are independent of the agent's action. Now, um, so this, this is something that was uh, uh, presumed in equality four, um, so uh, w the, the state of the world is independent of whether uh, the agent performs action A. Um, it might also, as equality six says, be independent of whether she performs action B. And in general, it might be that the state of the world is independent of um, any action that the, the agent uh, could perform. Now, the dominance principle uh, says that if A and B are mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive actions, then if in each state of the world, um, the so regardless of what the, the state of the world is, um, the outcome produced by action A is at least as good as, or in other words, has at least as much utility as, uh, the outcome produced by the action B. And if it, in at least one state of the world, the outcome produced by A is superior to, in other words, produces more utility than the outcome produced by B, then A dominates B, right? Um, so dominance is... Uh, a dominates B if in at least one state of the world A produces a better outcome than B and if in no states of the world uh, B produces a better outcome than A. So the dominance principle says that if A dominates B <coughs> in this way uh, then the agent should perform action A and that seems pretty plausible. Um... um Right, yeah. So, an example of this is a uh, straightforward example of a free bet. Um, so, uh, this is example two. Um, so, suppose you're offered a free bet that pays £100 if a fair coin lands heads and zero otherwise. So, there's no charge for taking this bet. You can take it for free. Um, a could be the action of accepting this free bet. B, the action of declining the free bet. Um, then, I mean, it's fairly easy to see that, uh, well, it's fairly intuitive that one should just take the bet, right? So, um, 
it produces a, a better outcome in one state of the world, namely uh, where the coin lands heads, uh, and no worse an outcome in uh, the state of the world where the coin lands tails, because if the coin lands tails you just where you were, uh, you've spent zero on the bet, you've received zero payoff, uh, but in the good state of the world, uh, you've paid zero for the bet and received a hundred pounds in payoff. So it seems obvious you should take the bet, and that's what dominance, the dominance principle says. So, I mean, we could tabulate this. So, uh, I mean, it's fairly obvious. Um, so, action A is taking the bet, accepting the bet for free. Uh, action action B is declining the bet, even though it's free. Uh, so those that. Uh, uh, given uh, the options given at the top of the table. Uh, and then the, on the left of the table, uh, the first column, uh, the states of the world, heads and not heads. So those are the two states of the world. Um, and if the agents accepted the bet, uh, performed action A, and heads arises, she gets £100. And, uh, actually, I'm sort of, I'm kind of um, supposing that, uh, just for simplicity, that... Uh, each pound corresponds to a unit of utility. Um, that's a rather simplistic assumption. So I'm supposing that um, uh, uh, if the agent gets a pound, then she has like one unit of utility. If she gets two pounds, she has two units. Uh, if she has zero pounds, she has zero units. If she has a hundred pounds, then that gives her a hundred units. That's simplifying for various reasons, one of which is that it supposes... Um, that uh, the uh, marginal utility associated with money for the agent um, is is constant. Um, so actually, normally we probably suppose that um, uh, that utility declines in money. So your first ten thousand pounds brings you a lot more utility than your second £10,000, um, which brings you a lot more utility than your thousandth £10,000. Um, so we could suppose that the bets, to, I mean, another a way of avoiding this assumption would be to expect that somehow the bet is conducted in terms of units of utility rather than pounds. So um, if heads happens, then uh, uh, you get, enough money to give you 100 units of utility, even if that not, might not be £100. But anyway, uh, we, we don't really need to worry about that complication uh, for present purposes. Okay, so... So here the dominance principle seems very plausible, and actually the expected utility calculation is also going to indicate that you should perform heads, um... You can calculate that for yourself. It's very simple. Um, but there are some circumstances in which the dominance principle isn't plausible. And specifically, the dominance principle isn't plausible um, when the state of the world isn't independent of one's action. Um, so there's a, hopefully an intuitive Example of this is example three on the handout of the exam. So, this example uh, may be a bit close to home for some of you, but um, I guess suppose you are offered a free bet that pays uh, $50,000, £50,000, whatever, uh, if you get a a first in your exams, and zero if you don't. Um, now, as before, we can let action A be the act of accepting this free bet, and action B the act of declining this free bet. Um, now, suppose that... We're supposing, again, just the sim simple equation between utility and, and money... Um, uh, and another assumption I'll make uh, is that getting a first in your exams on its own without the extra payoff uh, would bring you the same utility as uh, $50,000 on it. So I don't need to make that assumption, but it's just a straightforward one to make. So 
getting um, uh, getting a first would bring you fifty thousand units of utility or or fifty units of utility. Um, getting uh, fifty thousand dollars would would give you uh, fifty thousand units of utility as well. Um, uh, or I'll, I'll simplify by supposing it's fifty again. Um, okay, good. So, so then the um, I mean, what matters is the relative utilities, not the absolute utilities. So, uh, it's fine to assume both bring fifty units of utility um, or fifty thousand. It makes no difference because uh, all we're interested in is the relative utilities. Um, so basically. The, this sort of decision problem is represented um, in uh, table two. And so, again, at the top of the table are the actions available to the agents. So she can accept the free bet or she can decline the free bet. Um, and on the left are the states of the world. So she gets a first. She doesn't get a first. So... Uh, if she gets a first, having declined the bet, then she gets 50 units of utility, which is just the intrinsic value to her of getting a first. Uh, if she uh, accepts the uh, the the bet um, uh, and also gets a first, then she gets twice as much utility. Uh, she gets uh, 100 units of utility rather than 50. Uh, if she doesn't get a first, then no matter whether she accepts the bet or not, she gets zero units of utility because firstly, she doesn't get the utility associated with the first. Um, and secondly, because she's... De uh, sorry. And secondly, because she doesn't get a first, uh, no matter whether she accepted the bet or not, she doesn't get the, the payoff of the bet. Um, so we can see from this table uh, that uh, accepting the bet, that is action A, dominates action B, um, and that's because regardless of what the state of the world is, uh, it brings at least as much utility as action B, uh, and in one state of the world it brings more utility. So specifically uh, in the state of the world in which she gets a first, uh, Action A, accepting the bet, brings more utility than action B, uh, 100 versus 50. And in the other state of the world in which she doesn't get a first, A results in no less utility uh, than B does because they're both zero. So uh, uh, a, it, uh, this implies that A dominates B. Uh, so the dominance principle would seem to suggest that uh, the agent ought to uh, accept the free bet. Now, there is a problem for the dominance principle, however, um, if we let the uh, decision made by the agent um, uh, have an influence uh, on the state of the world. So, a sort of, we could give a sort of very natural story about how this might happen. So, Suppose when you're considering whether to accept this free bet, you know that the extra pressure uh, of the potential $50,000 is going to make you more nervous about your about your exams than you'd otherwise be, because now sort of there's, there's more riding on it. Um, so not only is it the intrinsic value of a first, uh, but it's also this additional... 50 grand that you stand to to potentially win so you can see how that might make you more nervous it might increase the pressure and suppose that you know that nerves tend to make you perform less well in exams um certainly too many nerves um then it might be that uh or then it will be that your credence is concerning the state of the world uh i.e whether you get a first or not aren't independent of whether or not you accept the free bet. Um, specifically, uh, declining the bet makes it more likely that you'll get a first um, than uh, does accepting the bet. Um, 
And so in this scenario, we'll see that although accepting the bet dominates uh, decline of the bet, it's a lot less plausible that what you should do is accept the bet. Uh, so specifically, we might suppose uh, that uh, the probability or your credence that you'll get a first if you accept the bet is 0.2. Whereas your credence that you'll get a first if you decline the bet is 0.9. So that's just inequ oh, sorry, it's just equality 7 and 8 on the handout. Now, uh, we can apply a theorem of the probability calculus, conditional complementation. Um, so uh, we can get the pr uh, to derive the probability of, of not getting a first conditional upon accepting the bet and not getting a first conditional upon declining the bet. Um, and uh, so uh, the probability of not getting a first conditional upon accepting is uh, 0.8, um, just because the probability of getting first conditional upon accepting is 0.2, um, and the probability of not getting a first conditional upon declining is 0.1, just because the probability of uh, getting a first conditional upon declining is 0.9. Okay, so... Um, then we can just do our expected utility calculation uh, using the, the formula that we, we originally introduced. And uh, the expected utility for such an agent of action A is uh, the utility associated uh, with performing A and getting a first, namely 100 units of utility, uh, multiplied by the probability uh, that she gets a first if she performs um, that action A of accepting the bet, uh, which we've given as 0.2. So that's the first term. And then to that we add uh, the uh, utility uh, of not getting a first, uh, which is zero, multiplied by the probability of not getting a first, uh, conditional upon performing action A, which is uh, 0.8. Uh, so that second term obviously becomes 0. The first term is 20. Uh, so overall, the uh, expected utility of accepting the free bet in this scenario is 20. Um, on the other hand, uh, when we calculate the expected utility of action B, uh, what we do is we take the um, uh, the utility associated with getting a first uh, if uh, she performs action B, um, namely of uh, declining the bet, which is 50 units of utility, multiply that the probability that she'll get a first if she performs action B, which is 0.9, higher than if she performs action A, um, so 0.9 times uh, 50, which is 0.45. Um, sorry, it's, it's not 0.45, it's 45. Um, and we add that to the uh, uh, utility that she'd get if she doesn't get a first, um, uh, namely zero, um, by the uh, probability that she won't get a first if she performs action B, which is point 0.1, so this cancels out uh, to zero. Um, and so we get an overall utility of, uh, expected utility of 45. Uh, that's a typo where it says 0.45, it should say 45. Um, okay, so what we find is that actually the expected utility of declining the free bet in this case is higher at 45 uh, than the expected utility of accepting the free bet, which is which is 20. Uh, so expected utility theory uh, recommends accepting the bet. And so in this case, it conflicts with the dominance principle. Um, and so basically what's going on is that the... Uh, the accepting the bet so strong makes you so nervous about your exam uh, that it just reduces the chance very strongly that you'll uh, get the first and, and therefore derive the intrinsic value of that and get the payout. Um, and it's so strong that it's actually better not to accept the bet in the first place, according to expected utility theory. 
Um, so it contradicts the dominance principle. We've seen that the dominance principle implies that you should accept the free bet in this case. Um, moreover, I think intuitively it just seems that the implication of expected utility theory here is right and the implication of the dominance principle is, is just wrong. Uh, so it's implausible that the dominance principle applies uh, when uh, the outcome's not independent of the state of the world. In this case, uh, the outcome being uh, the uh, uh, whether you uh, the, the amount of money you win. Oh, sorry, the amount of utility you derive um, and uh, the uh, state of the world being whether you get a first or not. Um, your action uh, influences uh, of accepting the bet versus not accepting the bet uh, affects the probability uh, of you getting a first or not, and, and so the, that's what that explains why the dominance principle isn't plausible in this case. Okay. Okay. Now, before we finally introduce causal expected utility theory, which is uh, going to play on this issue of an action's influencing the state of the world um, we need another distinction um, which will allow us to compare uh, causal decision theory to evidential decision theory um, uh, or standard expected utility theory in other words um, now in the case we've just described um, so we've seen that the recommendation of orthodox expected utility theory appears to be the right one. The recommendation of the dominance principle appears to be the wrong one. Um, now, sort of what's happened there is we found that uh, the reason for this was that the, the state of the world wasn't probabilistically independent of your action. Um, why wasn't it probabilistically independent. That is, why uh, was your getting a first or not, the state of the world, not independent of whether or not you accepted the bet? Well, it seems to be something to do with causation, right? So accepting the bet causes you to be nervous, uh, and being nervous causes you, uh, or at least has a causal tendency, uh, to uh, prevent you from doing well in the exam. So, uh, the state of the world, in other words, how well you perform in the exam, uh, is causally affected by your action to accept the free bet. Now, there are other cases in which uh, an outcome, or an, a state of the world and therefore an outcome, is not probabilistically independent of your action. Um, but that's not because your action causally affects the outcome. And in these sorts of cases, actually, it seems the dominance principle rather than orthodox expected utility theory uh, that seems to be the most, most, more plausible principle in these cases. So let's illustrate again an example will make this more concrete. Um, so this is example for smoking, right? So we all know now that um, smoking tends to cause uh, lung cancer. Um, now, there was a time, I think, back in the uh, 60s, I think, um, when obviously a lot of scientific evidence was starting to point towards uh, a causal link between uh, smoking and lung cancer. And people get increasingly concerned about this. The tobacco companies obviously... Um, were worried about this because, uh, uh, apparently not because they were concerned about people's health, but because they were concerned about the impact uh, that this could have on their profits. Um, and uh, they tried to defend themselves against this claim that smoking causes cancer. Um, and what they said is, or at least they speculated that there was a gene that some people had that firstly made them more likely to smoke and secondly made them more likely to get cancer. Uh, but it brought about these effects independently. So if you have the gene, 
you're more likely to uh, smoke and you're independently more likely to get cancer. So rather than the uh, smoking bringing about the cancer, their speculation or their claim was uh, that there was some gene uh, that uh, uh, causes uh, each of smoking and cancer independently. Uh, so that was a claim. It's now been discredited. Um, but let's just suppose for the sake of this example that the tobacco companies had turned out to be right so that the gene causes both smoking and cancer rather than uh, smoking itself causing cancer. Now, if that were right, then suppose that we've got someone who likes smoking and they're deciding whether to continue smoking or not. Um, suppose that smoking uh, will, because they like smoking, bring them some utility, maybe 10 units of utility. Uh, but this isn't nearly as much as the, of course, the disutility associated with getting cancer. Well, suppose that's minus 1,000 units of utility. Now, uh, in this sort of hypothetical world, the relevant states of the world concern whether the agent has the gene or not, the gene that, uh, according to the tobacco companies, produces both smoking and cancer. Um, now, the uh, associated utilities are set out in Table 3. So, if the agent has the gene and smokes, uh, and I'm, suppo I'm supposing, just for simplicity, that... Uh, the gene uh, deterministically brings about cancer. Um, then uh, the agent is going to get minus 990 uh, units of utility because she's going to uh, get cancer, which brings her minus 1,000 units. Uh, but um, because she's decided to smoke, and smoke brings her 10 units of utility, uh, this is going to, to a small, de very small degree, offset some of the negative utility of the cancer. Um, and uh, so we're going to subtract the 10 units of utility from the uh, 1,000 units of disutility. And the result is we get a, 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 a number negative 990 for the disutility she gets if she smokes and has a gene. If she smokes and doesn't have the gene, uh, then uh, she gets uh, she doesn't get cancer um, and she does get the 10 units of utility um, uh, from uh, smoking. Okay, on the other hand, uh, if she chooses not to smoke, that is decision B, um, and she has the gene, then she gets a negative thousand units of utility because she gets cancer in virtue of the gene and there's no offset because uh, she doesn't get the 10 units of utility from smoking. Uh, on the other hand, if she decides not to smoke and doesn't have the gene, then she gets zero utility. So she doesn't get the negative utility of cancer because she doesn't have the gene, but she's also decided not to smoke so she doesn't get the positive utility of smoking. Now, interestingly, in this case, um, action A dominates action B. Um, in particular, in both states of the world, action A of smoking has higher utility uh, than uh, action B of not smoking um, because uh, uh, smoking... Um, uh, offsets some of the disutility associated with cancer if 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 the agent has a gene um, and in the case where she doesn't have the gene well she still gets the 10 units of utility from smoking um, so uh, in this case um, The, the the dominance reasoning actually seems pretty plausible, I think. So if we set aside what we actually know, which is that smoking causes cancer, if we suppose that the tobacco company's dream had come true 
Um, and uh, that uh, you're either born with this gene or you, you, you don't, and whether you smoke uh, has no effect on whether you have this gene, uh, then uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it seems that if you do enjoy smoking, then you might as well smoke because nothing you can do affects whether you have this gene. So you might as well get those 10 utilities. Uh, units of utility from uh, from smoking. Um, okay, now uh, in this case, it's worth noting that the state of the world, even though the dominance reasoning looks right. Uh, in this, uh, uh, as it, uh, well, yeah, so the dominance principle looks right. Uh, but in this case, as in the last case, uh, the exam case, where the dominance reasoning looked wrong, uh, it's also true uh, that the state of the world isn't probabilistically independent of the agent's decision. Specifically, uh, the probability that the agent has the gene, given that she smokes, is greater than the probability that she has the gene, given that she doesn't smoke. Uh, and that's because um, the gene causes both smoking and cancer. Uh, and because it causes smoking, um, it means that people who smoke are more likely to be ones who have the gene. So the probability um, of having the gene is higher if you smoke than if you don't, Just uh, not because uh, smoking causes you to have the gene, uh, but rather because um, it's an effect of having the gene. Um, so this is just analogous to someone saying... Uh, that uh, if you have a temperature, you're more likely to have coronavirus than if you don't have a temperature. It's not because having a temperature causes coronavirus, but it's rather because having a temperature is an effect of having coronavirus. Sorry, all my examples about coronavirus these days. Um, all right, so... Right, so we we could suppose that... Um, specifically, equalities 11 and 12 hold. So, equality 11 says uh, the probability that the agent has the gene, uh, given that she smokes, is 0.9. The probability that she has the gene, given that she doesn't smoke, is 0.2. Now, if we have those probabilities, then we can form an expected utility calculation given the utility set out in uh, table three. So we can calculate the expected utility associated with smoking by multiplying the utility of smoking, if you have the gene, um, by the probability that uh, you have the gene, given that you smoke, which is 0.9. Uh, so that gives a first term of negative uh, 891. So the, pro the utility of uh, smoking, at, uh, if you have the gene, is negative 990. Multiply that by 0.9, which is the probability that you have the gene if you smoke, uh, gives a, a result of negative uh, 891. Um, on the other hand... Um, uh, we look at the uh, scenario in which uh, you smoke um, uh, and uh, don't have the gene. The utility associated with that is 10. Um, and multiply that by the probability um, that uh, you uh, uh, don't have the gene uh, if you smoke, and that's uh, 0 0.1, um, and uh, 10 times 0 0.1 is just 1. Uh, so the expected utility associated with smoking is negative uh, 890. Um, now we can calculate the expected utility uh, associated with the decision not to smoke, uh, and 
that's just very similar. So the utility of um, uh, uh, the utility uh, if you perform action B um, and have the gene is negative a thousand. Multiply that by the probability that you uh, have the gene condition upon uh, uh, not smoking, which is 0.2. Uh, that gives us a figure of negative 200. On the other hand, the utility of um, not having the gene uh, and uh, uh, not smoking is zero. Um, and we multiply that by the probability uh, that you um, uh, don't have the gene if you uh, uh, don't smoke, and that's uh, 0.8, uh, but obviously that cancels to zero because you're multiplying by zero. Uh, so the overall expected utility associated with not smoking is negative 200. So interestingly here, uh, in this smoking example, uh, Expected utility theory, standard uh, expected utility theory or evidential decision theory, uh, gives the verdict that uh, you ought not to smoke. Um, uh, that's because the expected utility of that decision is negative 200, whereas the expected utility of the converse decision to smoke um, uh, is negative 890. So obviously negative 200 is greater than negative 890. Uh, so expected utility theory mandates not smoking. But that seems like the wrong verdict, right, in the case where we're supposing that smoking doesn't cause cancer. Uh, because um, uh, it seems like because smoking doesn't cause cancer, you you might as well smoke. Right, so either you have the gene or you don't. Uh, there's nothing you can do uh, that will affect whether you have the gene. And if you have the gene uh, and smoke, then you get more utility than if you have the gene and don't smoke. And if you uh, 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 if you don't have the gene and smoke, you have more utility than if you don't have the gene and don't smoke. So there's sort of there's a dominance principle uh, in play. Um, uh, uh, and here, what you do doesn't affect the state of the world, so it seems like you might as well smoke. Um, so, so a lot of people find the recommendation of expected utility theory uh, in this sort of case um, to 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 be implausible. Okay, so. I suppose a sort of interesting moral to take home from the smoking example versus the exam example. So in both states, in both cases, the state of the world wasn't independent of the decision. However, in the exam case, uh, the state of the world wasn't independent of the decision because uh, the state of the world was causally influenced by the decision. So whether you get a first is causally influenced by whether you take the free bet uh, because the free bet affects how nervous you are. Uh, in the smoking case, uh, although there's no probabilistic independence of the state of the world from the decision, so although you're more likely to have the gene if you smoke, that's not because smoking uh, causally influences whether you have the gene and therefore whether you get cancer in this scenario, uh, but rather it's because uh, they're kind of independent effects of a common cause. They're correlated because they have a common co uh, cause, or rather the states of the world are correlated because they have a common cause, uh, namely having the gene, and the reason that uh, the... Uh, the action is is correlated uh, with having the gene is not because the action causes whether the uh, the gene is had, uh, but rather conversely because uh, the gene causes uh, the action of or tends to cause uh, people to smoke. Um, so in cases it seems where. Uh, causation of the state of the world by the action uh, 
explains um, why uh, the uh, right. So, so, sorry, I should say uh, in cases uh, where it looks like uh, your action actually causes the state of the world or causally influences it. It seems more plausible that you should take that into consideration uh, than cases where or your actions correlated uh, with the state of the world, um, but doesn't cause the state of the world, as in the smoking case. And this is essentially what causal decision theory is saying. So causal decision theory is sort of uh, uh, a rival to evidential decision theory. Um, you could view it as a heterodox version of expected utility theory, whereas evidential theory, uh, evidential decision theory, is the orthodox version of expected utility theory. Uh, it's one that has gained quite a lot of popularity among philosophers. Um, now, basically, causal decision theory is telling us not to confuse causation with correlation. Right. So the claim is that. Uh, expected utility theory tends to get the wrong results in some cases because it conflates causation with correlation or because it's insensitive to the difference between uh, causation and correlation. So uh, the claim of causal decision theory is that we should focus not on the probabilities that various outcomes have conditional upon our actions, but rather on the tendency of our actions to bring about those outcomes. Um, this causing or bringing about is normally understood in counterfactual terms. So some of you uh, will have previously studied causation, maybe as part of a metaphysics class, um, and uh, uh, you'll know that one theory of causation is a counterfactual theory. So for A to cause B, what it means for A to cause B is for it to be the case that if A hadn't happened, then B wouldn't have happened. So uh, we say, for instance, that the, the impact of the brick caused the window to break. Um, and what that, that amounts to is the claim that if the uh, brick hadn't hit the window, then the window wouldn't have broken. So causal decision theory is interested not in the probability of the outcome conditional upon the decision, uh, but the probability uh, that if you were to perform action A, uh, then some outcome would occur. Now, as some of you will be familiar with, but not all of you, uh, there's a sort of standard way of formulating or formalizing counterfactuals in terms of uh, the box arrow notation given on the handout. Um, so uh, A box arrow OI uh, is to be understood as the counterfactual that says that if I performed action A, then outcome OI would occur. Now, the causal decision theorist tells us we should be interested not in conditional probabilities of outcome OI given A, uh, but rather in the probabilities that the counterfactual holds that if I were to perform A, uh, then OI would be the result. So the causal decision theorist version of expected utility theory, this heterodox uh, uh, form of decision theory, uh, tells us that we should assess uh, what's known as the causally expected uh, utility of action A rather than the standard expected utility of action A. Uh, we could denote this EUC of A. <coughs> and the formula that they give is this one on the handout. So uh, this says that the causally expected utility of A uh, is again a, a kind of weighted sum of the utilities associated with the possible outcomes of A, but uh, rather than weighting the possible the utilities of the possible outcomes uh, by uh, the probability of those outcomes conditional upon uh, the performance of A, uh, rather we weight them by the probability that 
a counterfactual holds a counterfactual that says that if A had happened or if, if I were to perform A, uh, then outcome OI would result. Uh, we'll give an illustration of this and we'll see how this differs from the causal, uh, from the evidential decision theorist recommendation. So causal decision theory, just to be clear, says that when an action is faced with a set, when, it, when an agent is faced with a set of mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive possible outcomes, she should perform the one with the highest expected utility. Uh, where expected utility, I should say, is, is understood in terms of uh, this uh, formula. Um, so it's causally expected utility uh, as distinct from the evidential decision theorist formula. Okay, so what does this imply about the smoking example? Well, Note that if the agent thinks that whether she smokes or not doesn't cause the influence whether or not she has the gene, uh, then her credences will be such that the probability she assigns to the counterfactual, if I smoke, then I'll have the gene, should be equal to the uh, probability she assigns to the conditional, if I don't smoke, then I'll have the gene. That is just a sort of fancy way of saying that um, uh, the agent believes that whether or not she smokes uh, makes no difference to whether or not she has the gene. So, uh, there's no sort of causal tendency of her smoking or her decision to smoke uh, to influence whether or not she has the gene. <coughs> um, okay, right. So she might well think that uh, the probability of her having the gene is higher conditional upon her smoking just because the uh, the gene tends to cause smoking. But she doesn't think that uh, the decision whether to smoke uh, has a causal influence on the probability of whether or not she has the gene. And because she doesn't think it has a causal influence upon uh, whether or not she has the gene, she doesn't think that it has a causal influence on whether or not she gets cancer. Like, she doesn't think her decision has that causal influence on whether she gets cancer. So... All right, so the agent we're supposing believes this tobacco company story, and in fact, just to to make things clearer, we'll suppose that the we're we're in a world in which the tobacco companies have been correct that actually deciding wh whether or not you smoke uh, doesn't influence whether or not you uh, get cancer uh, uh, because. They're both explained by whether or not you have this gene. So this equality on the handout holds, so the agent thinks that um, the probability that uh, she has the gene if she smokes uh, is, uh, or the probability she would have the gene if she would smoke, uh, is equal to the probability that she uh, would have the gene if she didn't smoke. Um, and we'll let x stand for whatever this value is. So the two probabilities are equal. We'll suppose that x is whatever the probability she assigns to these two possibilities. Um, okay. Now, uh, uh, remember that we're uh, supposing for simplicity that everyone who has the gene develops cancer, and uh, everyone who doesn't, doesn't. Uh, then we can calculate the causally expected utility fairly straightforwardly. So X, remember, stands for uh, the probability of the two conditionals, which are equal. Um, and what we want to do is uh, multiply, uh, according to this uh, formula for expected utility theory, we want to multiply uh, the utility uh, that uh, she gets if she smokes and uh, uh, has the gene uh, by the 
probability X uh, that uh, if she smokes, uh, she has the gene. Um, and we want to add that uh, to the utility that she gets uh, from smoking if she doesn't have the gene uh, multiplied uh, by the probability uh, that if she smokes, she doesn't have the gene, uh, which is just going to be 1 minus the probability um, uh, that if she smokes, she does have the gene, uh, so 1 minus x. So we just need to do some algebra now. Um, so uh, the first term gives a result of uh, minus 990x, uh, where x is uh, this probability. Um, and uh, we just multiply out the brackets in the second term, so we get um, uh, 10 minus 10x. Uh, so simplifying, we have, um, uh, just, just by doing the algebra, we, we get the result that the causally expected utility of smoking is equal to 10 minus 1,000x. We do the same sort of calculation for the option of not smoking. And uh, so we multiply the utility of not smoking if you have the gene, which is negative 1,000, uh, by this, this probability, probability x, which is the probability that if you uh, don't smoke, you have the gene. Uh, you add that to uh, the utility of not smoking if you don't have the gene, which is zero, uh, multiplied by the probability that you don't have the gene um, if you smoke, uh, which is uh, equal to one minus the probability that you do have the gene if you smoke. Um, and again, just some uh, basic algebra um, uh, yields the result that the causally expected utility of not smoking is negative 1,000. Now, note that uh, this means that the causally expected utility of uh, not smoking is lower than the causally expected utility of smoking. Right, because um, the causally expected utility of not smoking is negative 1,000x, whereas the causally expected utility of smoking is 10 minus negative 1,000x. And because 10 is positive, um, that means that that's a greater utility um, than the causally expected utility of, of B. Um, so the causal decision theorist actually recommends that you smoke in this case, which is in accordance with the dominance reasoning, uh, but contrary, <coughs> contrary to the verdict of the evidential decision theorist. And in this case, where we're supposing it's true uh, that uh, smoking doesn't causally influence whether you get cancer because there's a gene that explains both, uh, then the causal decision theorist seems to intuitively, I think, have, have the right verdict. Now, the Newcomb problem, which you'll have come across in your reading, uh, is uh, just very similar to example four, uh, but it's a, a, a bit more extreme. Uh, and... So I guess brings the difference between causal decision theory and evidential decision theory into sharper relief. Um, so it was actually uh, partly in response to the Newcomb problem that uh, causal decision theory was, was first developed. So the problem is as follows. It's a bit science fiction -y, a bit fanciful. Uh, so we suppose that there's a demon who is an exceptionally reliable predictor of people's choices. The demon has a huge track record of successful prediction, uh, both of your decisions and other people's decisions. Uh, the demon has some method. Maybe they study people's brains with an MRI or something, and, and somehow they're an expert in um, brain science. Um, um, and somehow the demon, sort of via this method, uh, knows 
not only what you're going to decide um, before you've decided, but even knows what your response will be uh, well ahead of your being confronted with the decision problem. So in other words, uh, effectively, they, they, the daemon looks at your brain at some initial time and then knows how you respond to any possible decision that you might be confronted with. And the demon has an exceptional track record, so maybe gets only one in a billion predictions wrong. Now, this demon likes to play a game with people, um, and this, this is the Nukem problem game. Um, the decision that people make is among those that the demon is enormously successful in predicting, only gets one in a billion wrong. Um, so the game is as follows. Uh, the demon places two boxes in front of the participant. Box one is transparent, so the, the participant can see the contents, and it contains $1,000. The, the participant can see this. Box two is opaque, um, so the participant can't see what's in it. Um, but the demon tells the participant, um, well, suppose the participant trusts the demon, um, uh, the demon tells the participant that the box contains either a million dollars or no dollars. Now, the participant is given the choice by the demon whether to open just box two, the one that is opaque and contains either a million dollars or nothing, uh, and to keep anything which she finds in box two, or to open be both boxes and keep the contents of both boxes. Now, the, the demon operates as follows. If it has predicted that the participant will just choose to open box two, the opaque one, then it has put a million dollars in box two. If it is pre predicted that the participant will choose to open both boxes, then it has put zero dollars in box two. Uh, now, suppose you find yourself to be a participant in one of these games, the question is, what should you do? Now, in fact, uh, among philosophers, the Newcomb problem splits opinion between so-called one-boxers, who think that rationality requires taking just box two, and so-called two-boxers, who think that rationality requires taking both boxes. So, there seem to be good arguments for both for one boxing and for two boxing. So the argument for one boxing is that if you take both boxes, uh, then the demon will have predicted this and will have put zero dollars in box two, so almost certainly you'll get only a thousand dollars. But if you took a, if you took box two alone, um, then you'd almost certainly get a million dollars. So you might think, well, it seems that you should one box, right? So uh, why take both boxes if this almost guarantees you only $1,000, where taking only box two would guarantee you, uh, almost certainly guarantee you a million dollars? It seems intuitive to one box. The argument for two boxing, on the other hand, <coughs> is that the demon's already made its prediction and has already put either a million dollars or zero dollars in the opaque box two, if the demon's already put a million dollars in box two and you two box, then you'll receive a uh, million dollars plus the thousand dollars in uh, box one. Whereas if you one box, you'll receive only a million dollars. So you get the sort of thousand dollars kind of for free by taking box one as well as box two. On the other hand, if the demon hasn't put box uh, uh, has, sorry, has put zero dollars in box two, and you two box, then uh, at least you'll receive a thousand dollars. Whereas if you'd one boxed, uh, then uh, you'd have received zero dollars. So uh, the demon, in other words, the demon's I already, before you make the decision, either put a million dollars or put zero in box two, uh, <clears throat> what you do or not doesn't causally affect what the demon's done, and um, 
uh, uh, so uh, it seems you might as well take t uh, take both boxes because uh, irrespective of whether the demon supplies a million dollars or uh, zero dollars in box two, uh, you'll get a thousand extra dollars if you two box rather than one box. So that this is sort of invoking dominance reasoning. Uh, so table four sets out the decision problem. <clears throat> if you one box, um, the state of the world is such that there's a million dollars in box one, then you get a million dollars. But if you two box, you do got a million dollars plus a thousand dollars um on the other hand if there's zero in box two uh and you one box you get zero um uh but whereas if you two box you get a thousand dollars so it seems that uh two box two boxing just dominates one boxing um okay so the dominance principle it tells that one should two box um and Basically, we'll see that causal decision theory endorses two boxing, whereas evidential decision theory endorses one boxing. And the question is, which one's correct? Right, okay. So, the first thing to note is that this is a case where the state of the world is very far from being probabilistically independent of the agent's action. Uh, and so this makes it like both the exam case uh, and the smoking case. Uh, so in both of those scenarios, uh, there was no probabilistic independence between the agent's decision and the state of the world and therefore the outcome. So uh, in particular, uh, the probability uh, that there's a million dollars in box two conditional upon one boxing is uh, very high. Uh, so uh, it's only one in a billion that there's not a million dollars in box two, uh, given that you one box uh so um, the the probability uh, that there is a million dollars in box two, given that you one box, is uh, one minus one in a million. So it's very high. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the probability that there's a million dollars in box two, uh, given that you two box, sorry, I should have said one in a billion, uh, the probability that there's a million dollars in box two, given that you two box, uh, is uh, one in a billion. Um, and so, basically, as a consequence of this, um, uh, one boxing is just going to straightforwardly maximise evidentially expected utility. Um, so... Uh, Basically, according to the evidential expected utility theorist, uh, we take the utility associated with uh, one boxing if there's a million dollars in uh, box two, which is the one you select if you one box, uh, multiplied by the probability uh, that uh, there's a million dollars in box two, conditional upon your one boxing, which is this very high number, 0.999, etc. Um, and we add it uh, to the uh, uh, utility that you get if uh, you one box and there's zero, uh, uh, there's nothing in, there's zero dollars in, in uh, box two, multiplied by the probability that there's zero dollars in box two, conditional upon your one boxing, which is a very low number. Um, and the upshot is that the overall uh, expected utility associated with one boxing is just a shade under a uh, million dollars. Uh, whereas the evidentially expected utility theory Oh, sorry, the evidentially expected utility of two boxing. Um, what we do is we take the utility of two boxing if there's a million, 
million dollars in uh, in the second box, um, and multiply that by the probability that there's a million dollars in the second box if you two box, which is very low, or conditional upon your two boxing, which is very low, uh, and we add that to the utility that you get um, uh, if you two box and there's not a million dollars in the uh, uh, second box, uh, multiplied by the probability um, of uh, there being uh, not a million dollars in the second box, uh, conditional upon your two boxing, boxing which is very high. Uh, and the upshot is that we get a, an expected utility of very close to $1,000. So uh, the expected utility, the evidential expected utility of one boxing is very close to a million dollars, of two boxing is very close to $1,000, just reflecting the fact that uh, the probability uh, that the uh, demon has put a million dollars in box two, uh, conditional upon your uh, one boxing is very high and conditional upon your uh, two boxing is very low. So evidentially, evidential decision theory recommends one boxing. Um, but what's interesting here is that although there's this correlation between one boxing uh, and a million dollars being placed by the demon in box two, um, this uh, correlation isn't one due to causation of uh, the demon's action by your action. Specifically, the demon acts earlier than you do. Um, so your decision about whether to one box or two box doesn't have a causal influence on what the demon has earlier done. So it doesn't have a causal influence on the state of the world uh, of whether there's a, a million dollars in box two. And consequently, so the case is, is analogous to the smoking case uh, where similarly your decision whether or not smoke doesn't have a causal influence upon uh, whether you have the gene and therefore whether you get cancer. Um, and it's disanalogous to the exam case where whether or not you take the free bet does causally influence the state of the world. In other words, whether or not uh, you get a first, uh, and so uh, affect uh, cause the influences the utility that you get. So, because the agent's action doesn't causally influence the state of the world, and because the agent knows this, uh, we know that the probability uh, that the agent assigns to uh, getting uh, to the being a million dollars in box two if she were to one box is equal to the probability that she assigns to the being a million dollars in box two if she were to two box and because of this two boxing maximizes causally expected utility so we know that her probability for the two counterfactuals is equal um, so we can let x stand for the value whatever it may be uh, that she assigns to uh, each of the uh, two counterfactuals, namely the counterfactual if she one boxes and there'll be a million dollars in box two, and if she were to two box, there'd be, there'd be a million bo uh, dollars in box two. Uh, and then we can run the cause of expected utility calculation. So uh, the expected cause of expected utility of one boxing is a uh, million dollars. Uh, which is the uh, the value of uh, um, one boxing uh, if there's a million dollars in box two, multiplied by the probability uh, that if she were to one box, uh, then there would be a million dollars in box two, which is X, um, added to uh, the uh, utility that she gets if there's not a million dollars in box two and she won boxes uh, multiplied by the probability that if uh, 
she were to one box, there wouldn't be a million dollars in box two, which is one minus the probability that if she were to one box, there would be a million dollars in box two. Uh, and basic algebra shows that uh, the causally expected utility, therefore, of one boxing is uh, a million times x. Um, we do a similar expected utility calculation for two boxing. So the probability or the utility that she gets if she two boxes and there's a million dollars in the first box is uh, a million plus a thousand. Uh, we multiply this by the probability uh, that if she were to two box, there would be a million dollars in box two, which is x. Um, and then we add to this the utility uh, that she gets if she two boxes and there's not a million dollars in box two, which is just a thousand, um, which is the amount of money in box one, uh, multiplied by uh, the probability uh, that if she were to two box, there wouldn't be a million dollars in box two, which is one minus the probability that if she were to two box, then there would be a million dollars in box two, which is X. Um, and again, basic algebra gives the upshot that the expected, causally expected utility of two boxing is a million X plus a thousand, which is greater than a million X, right? A million X plus a thousand is greater than a million X. So the causal expectation of two boxing is um, uh, a thousand units of utility higher than the causal expectation of one boxing. So causal decision theory recommends two boxing. So, I mean, it's interesting. So it seems that uh, I mean, philosophers actually are, are very divided about whether one boxing or two boxing is the rational strategy, and uh, their division of whether uh, one boxing or two boxing is the the rational strategy um, tends to be reflected in whether they think that evidential decision theory or causal decision theory is the better version of expected utility theory. Uh, those who like two boxing tend to be causal decision theorists. Those who like one boxing tend to be evidential decision theorists. Um, so it, it's uh, and there's no real settled um, settled view now on, on on which is the better strategy. But I mean, I suppose it's worth thinking when you're thinking about reflecting upon your own views, not simply your intuition about this one case, the Newcomb problem, but also. Uh, your intuition about related cases like the smoking case, which has a very similar structure uh, to the Newcomb problem. It's just a bit less extreme in terms of its probabilities. Um, so perhaps reflecting upon that case might um, uh, help you think about what you think is rationally justified in the uh, Newcomb problem case. Okay, so uh, that's that's finally it. It's been a very long lecture. Hopefully you've uh, taken breaks and uh, uh, given yourself time to have a cup of tea and uh, uh, take a break from this fairly dense material. Um, I'm sorry that it's uh, a bit unideal. It's not nearly as nice as having a face-to-face -face seminar. I hope you've got something out of it nevertheless and I hope you uh, have also got something out of the reading. Uh, please email me with any questions you have um, and I will respond as soon as I can. Okay, thanks for listening.